genuinely an honor to introduce our uh, speaker, Madame Louise Frechette, this, uh, this evening. Um, I guess we're really welcoming, welcoming her home, uh, for you all know her as uh, a distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Part of her role at CG has been to chair the project on nuclear energy and the challenges it presents to global governance, and of course, She's going to be speaking on that uh, very topic this, uh, this evening. But we also know her as a, one of Canada's preeminent public servants with an extraordinary career and record of service both nationally and internationally. There isn't uh, time to recount that entire career and all, all of those achievements this evening, but I did want to take a few minutes to, uh, to remind you of why the word extraordinary is the right one to use when, we, when we're talking about Louise Frechette. Her work in uh, the public service of Canada led her to its highest ranks. As a diplomat, her work included stints as ambassador to Argentina and Uruguay, and uh, later she served as Canada's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. As a member of the public service in, uh, in Ottawa, she also served as Associate Deputy Minister of Finance and as, as Deputy Minister of National Defense. Having served as the United Nations, as the United Na having, having served at the United Nations um, as Canada's ambassador, she returned there for an eight-year um, uh, stretch from 1998 to 2006 to serve as Deputy Secretary General of the, of the UN she was the first incumbent in that uh, post, and in it she worked closely with and assisted Secretary General Kofi Annan in the full range of his uh, uh, responsibilities. Her public service has extended to work on a wide range of organizational boards, including service as the chair of the, of the board of directors of the Pearson Peacekeeping Center. There are many others as well, and you'll be interested to note her uh, membership and uh, work on the board of the gov uh, board of governors of the University of uh, Waterloo. Madame Pr uh, Frechette pursued formal education in Montreal and Belgium, and she is, as you might expect, also the recipient of many awards and honors. That includes honorary degrees from a large number of uh, Canadian universities, including again the University of Waterloo, the Royal Military College and also from beyond Canada, including uh, from Kyung Hee University in Seoul, Korea, and the University of Turin in, in uh, Italy. She received the Distinguished Canadian Leadership Award of the University of Ottawa in 2005. Among other honors, Madame Frechette is an Officer of the Order of Canada. I wanted to, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, one, other, one other area of her work, and that is that she has also had very extensive engagement with the nuclear issues that she's going to address uh, tonight. She was invited by the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency to be a member of the Commission of Eminent Persons, which issued a report in 2008 on the challenges of nuclear energy and the future of the IAEA. She also served on the advisory committee to the International Commission on uh, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament established by the governments of Australia and uh, Japan, uh, established in, in 2008, and uh, its terrific report called The Eliminating Nuclear Threats was released in late 2009. It's uh, a great pleasure to have the uh, opportunity to hear you this evening, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, will you uh, join me in welcoming uh, Louise Frechette. Good evening, everybody, and first of all, let me thank you for joining me tonight on this Easter Monday. I was a little worried when it was suggested as I speak tonight that nobody would show up, so I'm very, <laughs> I'm very touched that uh, so many of you have. Oops. This yours, Ernie? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm really happy that so many of you have uh, made your way to CG to, uh, to listen to this presentation. 
I want to thank Ernie Regeer for his very, very generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, he's uh, far too generous in his uh, comments, but they're much appreciated. As he said, it's my, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm on my home turf when I address a CG uh, audience. Uh, and I must say that over the last nearly four years now, I've come to appreciate uh, not only CG as a, as a vibrant institution and the University of Waterloo because I am a member of, uh, of their board, but also this community, which is, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm right, considered one of the smartest communities on earth, and, uh, and now I know why. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be associated with CG, and I consider myself part of this community, at least part-time, even if I don't live here on a full-time basis. I should add that um, Ernie asked me whether my CV was up to date, and I said yes, but in fact it wasn't because um, I don't think it, uh, it mentions that I received quite recently a 100 degree from uh, Wilfrid Laurier as well. So I'm, I'm doubly associated with, uh, with universities in Waterloo. Now, as the title of my presentation indicates, I'm here to talk about global nuclear governance and in particular to share with you the conclusions of the project which I had the honor to chair at CG for over the last three years. Now let me state at the outset that I'm not an expert on nuclear matters and I have not had much to do with arms control and disarmaments in the course of my diplomatic career. I always considered this area uh, as one requiring infinite patience. And I saw my colleagues who worked in this area as kind of the monks of the diplomatic profession, people whose reward would come not in this world, but perhaps in the next. So you might ask how come I got involved in this nuclear issue? Well, the idea goes back to the end of 2005, as I was starting to think of my life after the United Nations. CG at that point invited me to join the organization and suggested I might want to do research on UN reform. I paused and said, no way. I really needed a change. I wanted to really get away from a subject that had occupied me morning, noon, and night for eight years, and I wanted to do something different. And I suggested to CG a project on nuclear issues instead. Why? Because I had been alarmed by the deepening divisions within the international community on nuclear issues, which had been revealed at the September 2005 UN summit. The fact that the summit communique did not contain a single line on nuclear proliferation and disarmament signaled serious problems in the global nuclear governance system. At the same time, talks of a nuclear revival <coughs> were starting to be heard with increasing frequency. This would mean more nuclear power plants, more nuclear material, more technicians and scientists with the detailed knowledge of nuclear technology. Thus was born the Nuclear Energy Futures Project, which concluded its work a few weeks ago. The purpose was threefold. First, to investigate the likely size, shape, and nature of the purported nuclear energy revival to the year 2030. Not to make a judgment on the merits of nuclear energy, but rather to predict its future. Second purpose of the project was to consider the implications for global governance in the areas of nuclear safety security, and non-proliferation. And third, to make recommendations to policymakers in Canada and abroad on ways to strengthen global governance in these areas. Before I want to uh, I go any further, I want to um, uh, inform you that the findings of the, the study are all available 
on uh, CG's website. It consists of, of three parts. There's a very long, detailed report, about 300 pages, plus a about 30, 40 page summary, which frankly, for everybody but the really keen people would give you plenty of information. And then there is an action plan where we try to extract key conclusions and recommendations for the benefit of our policymakers. And this document in particular has been circulated widely to decision makers in, 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 in Ottawa and in Ontario and uh, in many other uh, centers of, uh, of policy making in Canada and abroad. So let me start with the so-called nuclear renaissance. Why is there a renewed interest in nuclear power? Well, for some countries, concerns over climate change figure prominently. Nuclear is seen as offering a cleaner alternative to coal or oil, at least as a transitory solution until renewable sources like solar and wind can produce energy in sufficient quantities to satisfy large-scale demand. But for most countries, we found, for most countries contemplating new investment in nuclear energy, it is energy security rather than climate change that is the main motivation. In spite of the re recent financial downturn, all projections point towards continued growth in global energy demand over the next several decades. Meanwhile, the supply situation looks uncertain. Traditional sources of inexpensive oil are running out. The new ones are either more expensive, more polluting, or both, like the Canadian tar sands, or are located in politically unstable regions. Coal is in, abun in an abundant supply, but it remains for the time being at least a major producer of greenhouse gases. Natural gas and biofuels Hydro and renewables all have their limitations and drawbacks on the basis of the currently available technologies. The geopolitical outlook is adding to the worry. The multifaceted and never-ending conflict in the Middle East and Iran's presumed ambition in the region, new tensions growing between Russia and the West, continued risks of terrorist attacks, each raise the specter of major disruption in the flow of energy supplies and feeds a desire to reduce dependency from foreign sources where possible. In some developing countries, the nuclear option also seems to carry an element of enhanced national prestige, a symbol of economic progress and technological sophistication that holds attraction to countries seeking to consolidate their position vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors, as well as with foreign investors. Some observers ventured to predict that the number of power plants currently sitting at 436 could double over the next 20 to 25 years. Our study conclude that this is unlikely to happen at least between now and 2030. True, many countries have talked about turning to or returning to nuclear energy, including some of our provincial governments here in Canada. But while energy produced from nuclear plants is relatively inexpensive compared to other sources, the initial investment required to build the plant is extremely high. The price tag for a single plant is several billions of dollars, and countries must be prepared for significant time delays and cost overruns. Just to take the example of a recent construction in, in Finland, the plant begun in 2005 is now three years behind schedule, and its cost is projected to, re to reach $6.7 billion from an initial estimate of $4.5 billion. For all these reasons, many countries hesitate to take the plunge, even more if their public opinion is not entirely on side, as remains the case particularly in Western European countries. 
In the case of new aspirants, mostly developing countries that do not as yet, as yet have a nuclear, a civilian nuclear energy program, going nuclear also means passing appropriate legislation, setting up adequate regulatory and control infrastructures, training a whole army of technical and other staff. In some case, the existing electricity grid is insufficient and must be expanded. Now you can go to CG's website for a detailed survey of emergent nuclear energy states that shows where each of these countries stands in relation to the numerous steps required for a nuclear energy program to become a reality. This in-depth review has led us to conclude that of the 30 plus countries that have indicated an interest in developing a nuclear program, only a handful will likely have one up and running 20 years from now. The United Arab Emirates just signed a contract with a South Korean company for four reactors. Poland, Turkey, Algeria, Egypt, Indonesia, Jordan and Vietnam are considered the most serious candidates. But in fact, most of the nuclear revival will take place in countries that already have installed capacity, primarily China, India, and Russia. It is hard to tell what will happen beyond 2030. Much depends on the price of alternative sources like coal, gas, and oil. A hefty tax on carbon emissions, for instance, could level the playing field and make nuclear more attractive from an economic point of view. On the other hand, technological breakthroughs that could increase the attractiveness of wind, solar, and other renewables could weaken the case for nuclear. Bottom line, a nuclear revival of source is underway, but it is a modest one and it is likely to remain so over the next 20 years. It could gradually pick up speed over time, just as it could peter out if alternative sources of clean and inexpensive energy becomes available in the quantities required. Now, this is the background against which we then examine the various tools of global governance in place in the nuclear field to, ass to assess whether they are adequate to the task today and capable of handling growth in the future. Let me start with three general observations. The first observation is that there exists a vast assortment of cooperation agreements in the nuclear field. Legal instruments, like the Treaty on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and various conventions on safety and security. Global and regional institutions, like the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna and Euratom. And informal groupings, like the Nuclear Suppliers Group and industry associations, like the World Association of Nuclear Operators. This dense network of legal instruments, institutions, and informal arrangements has evolved in fits and starts and does not form a totally coherent whole. The various elements relating to safety, security, and non-proliferation operate independently from one another, and some are much more developed than others. There are obvious synergies among the various dimensions of nuclear governance which could be better exploited. The second observation is that nuclear governance has been seen as an exclusive responsibility of governments, particularly as it relates to security and non-proliferation. Industry could and should play a more active role in helping to ensure that the technology which they develop, sell, and exploit is used safely and for legitimate purposes only. We could achieve better results if all stakeholders in nuclear governance sat together more often to compare notes and harmonize approaches. My third general observation relates to the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Its workload keeps growing. More intrusive safeguard inspections are demanded. 
more demand for its services in matters of safety and security have been registered in the last several years. More technical assistance needs to be provided to developing and emerging countries in the use of nuclear technology. The budget allocated to the agency has not kept up with major contributors sticking for many years to an indiscriminate zero growth policy for all UN agencies, irrespective of the importance of their mission and the evolution of their workload. At a time when more could be done with smart investment in technology, the agency does not even have the means to refurbish, it, refurbish its laboratory, an essential tool for detecting illicit nuclear activity. With a budget of less than $500 million a year, the IAEA offers excellent value for money and should receive more adequate funding from its member states. Cooperation on matters relating to the safe operation of nuclear power plants received a boost after the accident at Chernobyl. International standards were strengthened. Greater priority was given to peer review processes carried out under the IAEA, and most countries got in the habit of inviting the agency to send evaluation missions. WANO, the World Association of Nuclear Operators, which was created after Chernobyl and now includes practically all nuclear operators, also conducts peer reviews of its members' safety record. These reviews are said to be of very high standard, although their results are not publicly available. Cooperation in nuclear safety is underpinned by legally binding agreements but the safety standards derived from the Convention and developed in the IAEA are not mandatory. Attempts to make them so would likely meet with stiff resistance. But there are other ways to improve global governance of nuclear safety. We should strive to ensure that existing peer review and on-site evaluation mechanisms are universally endorsed and applied that transparency is enhanced, and that newcomers to the nuclear energy world receive advice and assistance so that they apply the highest safety standards right from the start. Concern about the protection of nuclear installations against attacks and appropriation of nuclear material by terrorist groups have come to the fore in the wake of 9-11. An amendment to the 1980 Conven Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, which originally applied only to the transport of nuclear material across international borders, was agreed in 2005 so as to apply its provisions to domestic installations as well. But this amendment has not yet entered into force. The Security Council, under its Resolution 1540 of 2004, established mandatory steps that need to be taken by all states to keep weapons of mass destruction, and therefore including nuclear material, out of terrorist hands. New programs of assistance have been initiated to help poorer countries implement the protective measures required, but implementation of Resolution 15. 40 has been patchy at best. The nuclear security regime can therefore be enhanced if some of the good practices that have been put in place in the safety area were adopted in the security area as well. Excessive secrecy has to some extent hampered progress in that direction. The balance between confidentiality and transparency needs to be rethought if we want to improve global governance instruments and make peer reviews more feasible, for instance. As for the governance challenge in the non-proliferation area, they are well known. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, along with close cooperation among exporters of nuclear technology within the Nuclear Suppliers Group, are credited with preventing the multiplication of nuclear armed states. However, this regime was fragile from the beginning and is getting more fragile by the minute. 
The NPT was weakened from the word go by the refusal of three countries to sign it. Two, India and Pakistan, who proceeded openly to acquire nuclear weapons of their own, and a third, Israel, that is presumed to have done so. New fault lines have appeared in recent years. North Korea was the first signatory to withdraw from the treaty and carry out nuclear tests. The IAEA and a consortium of six states are still trying to put the genie back in the bottle. Iran, also a signatory, has further undermined the integrity of the NPT by its undeclared nuclear activities and its continued refu refusal to fully comply with all of the IAEA's requests for information and unrestricted access. Iran may or may not have a secret nuclear weapons program underway at the moment, but it is certainly determined to acquire the essential element of a technological capacity to have one if it so desires. To these developments must be added the discovery in the early 1990s of a secret nuclear program in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, revelations about the aborted Libyan program which had gained access to sensitive technologies thanks to the AQ Can underground network, and more recently, allegations of North Korean nuclear exports to Syria. It is hard not to conclude that the NPT is under serious strain and could even unravel if more such cases were to come to light, with more countries tempted to go nuclear in response to neighbors' moves in that direction. Meanwhile, the bilateral agreement negotiated between the United States and India, now endorsed by the Nuclear Suppliers Group, of which Canada is a member, will allow export of uranium and nuclear technology to India to resume. In exchange, India will place its civilian nuclear facilities under IAEA safeguards. It is not clear yet which facilities will be placed under safeguards, and India has only agreed to do this over several years. Furthermore, India has made no binding commitment to forego further testing or end the production of nuclear materials for weapons purposes. There may be many good and valid reasons for wishing to normalize nuclear relations with India, but the deal also sends the message to would-be nuclear weapon states that if they are stubborn enough and patient enough, the international community will eventually turn the page and accept the fait accompli. Some people argue that an increase in the number of nuclear weapon states should not alarm us unduly that the prospect of mutually assured destruction is sufficient to ensure that the weapons will never actually be used. While that may be a credible scenario in a world governed by reason, but I've seen enough insanity just in my own lifetime to refuse to bet my future and that of my family on the wisdom of world leaders alone. I think most people would agree that the world will be much safer if there is a robust non-proliferation regime in place. The question that arises then is whether, whether the current case-by-case -case management of new challenges to the non-proliferation regime is viable in the long term or whether a more systemic approach is required. Does the Dutch boy have enough fingers to plug all the holes in the dike, or should we think of refurbishing the dike? Many proposals have been made over the years to strengthen the non-proliferation regime, and some improvements have indeed been agreed. The negotiation of a model additional protocol to comprehensive nuclear safeguards agreements greatly expanded the IAEA's ability to verify a country's nuclear activities by giving it unlimited access to all nuclear facilities and the authority to investigate gaps or discrepancies in the information provided. New technological means are now available to the agency to keep a closer watch from a distance. It is important to note, however, 
that these new powers can only be exercised in countries that have negotiated an additional protocol with the IAEA. To date, 88 countries have done so, including four of the NPT's five designated nuclear weapon states. The U.S. has signed an agreement, but it has not yet entered into force. But countries such as Iran and Syria have not signed an additional protocol. The prospect of a nuclear revival has stimulated a number of more recent proposals. Let me say from the outset that I do not think a decision to acquire a nuclear energy production capacity increases in and of itself the risks of nuclear proliferation. Such a decision is perfectly legitimate under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, provided countries are prepared to place their entire program under IAEA safeguards. Indeed, the NPT is designed to encourage the use of nuclear technology for peace, peaceful purposes, and the IAEA receives significant sums every year to help developing countries in this area. The decision to build or acquire nuclear weapons is a deliberate political move which responds to geopolitical concerns either of an aggressive or defensive nature. It has little, if anything, to do with a perceived need to achieve energy independence or a desire to produce cleaner energy. Indeed, countries bent on mastering the technology to make the bomb do not need a civilian program to do so, although a civilian program can offer a useful cover for less legitimate activities. This being said, the so-called nuclear renaissance is not without relevance to non-proliferation concerns. First, as I said at the beginning, more nuclear power plants in more countries mean more nuclear scientists and technicians more individuals with knowledge and expertise who may, for whatever reason, be willing to apply their skills to a clandestine weapons program or get involved in illicit nuclear trade. Second, there could be cause for concern if one or several countries were to decide to develop an indigenous capacity to enrich uranium or reprocess their spent fuel. That decision could be based on genuine fears that nuclear fuels may be withheld from them for political reasons, or it could be motivated by commercial or nationalist ambitions, or it could be motivated by a desire to keep open the option of an eventual nuclear weapons program. Should neighboring states acquire such weapons, or should the international non-proliferation regime collapse and a new nuclear race ensue? This concern has led Russia, Germany, the UK, the former director general of the IAEA, Mohamed El Baradai, among others, to offer ideas aimed at developing new controls on the sensitive parts of the fuel cycle, meaning enrichment and reprocessing and addressing the issue of fuel supply guarantees. These proposals include creating an international fuel bank under IAEA control, setting up multilaterally supervised nuclear fuel services under which nuclear energy producing countries could lease low enriched uranium and return the spent fuel to the supplying countries for reprocessing or disposal. Control of the nuclear fuel cycle is, in my opinion, at the heart of the proliferation challenge. When the NPT was concluded 40 years ago, only a handful of countries could realistically aspire to enrich uranium or reprocess spent fuel to produce plutonium and therefore have the option of developing their own nuclear weapons. Nowadays, these processes are within the reach of any number of countries. The obvious way to reduce the risk of proliferation is to ensure that enrichment and reprocessing activities remain in safe hands. Naturally, the, the nuclear weapon states and the few others which currently supply nuclear fuels to most of the nuclear power plants in the world 
would like nothing better than to confirm their role in the supply function to the exclusion of all others in exchange for some international guarantee of access to nuclear fuel free from political interference. This is, of course, not a viable proposition. Even Canada, which renounced nuclear weapons long ago and has not been involved in the enrichment business, even though it is the largest uranium exporter in the world, even Canada is not prepared to relinquish its right to develop its own enrichment industry. And developing countries feel, feel even more strongly about this. The main concern of developing countries is that the NPT is an unequal treaty with different rights and obligations for different categories of countries. From the beginning, this was, this was seen as a temporary state of affairs, which would be remedied over time by the march towards full and complete disarmament. Progress on this front, at front has been painfully slow with many reversals and the end goal remains elusive. The last thing develop, developing and many developed countries will accept is the institution of a new two-tier system that would see a world divided not only between those who are allowed to have nuclear weapons and those who are not, but also between those who are allowed to enrich uranium and reprocess spent fuel and those who are not. The key to long-term sustainability of the non-proliferation regime is to transform it into a universal regime with equal rights and obligations for all. This means essentially two things. First, it means placing all sensitive parts of the nuclear fuel cycle under international authority and supervision. Current suppliers would have to accept some restriction on their sovereign control of enrichment and reprocessing activities. The internationalization can take many forms, and many ideas have been advanced already, but I believe that only those that are based on the principle of equality have the potential to achieve consensus. Second, it means recommitment to the goal of full and complete disarmament by the nuclear power states and concrete, concrete steps towards that end. On both these fronts, internationalization of the fuel cycle and disarmament, the leadership must come from the nuclear weapon states recognized under the NPT. If they show the way, it will generate enormous pressure on the three non-NPT signatories to follow suit. A stronger international consensus around nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament would raise the cost to those who would dare to go against the will of the entire international community. Is this all possible, you might ask? Is this utopia with a capital U? Well, you may have heard of the joint appeal signed by Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, William Perry, and Senator Sam Nunn in January of 2007. These gentlemen, none of whom can be described as romantic idealist, quite the contrary, argued that the notion of nuclear deterrence as it played out between the Soviet Empire and the West throughout the Cold War is no longer a viable concept in a world where threats to security take many forms and involve terrorist groups and rogue states ready to use the most extreme means to achieve their goals. Let me quote from the four distinguished gentlemen's renewed call published in the Wall Street Journal on the 15th of January, 2008. Quote, in some respects, the goal of a world free of nuclear weapons is like the top of a very tall mountain. From the vantage point of our troubled world today, we can't even see the top of the mountain. And it is tempting and easy to say we can't get there from here. But the risks from continuing to go down the mountain or standing pat are too real to ignore. We must chart a course to higher ground where the mountain top becomes more visible." End of quote. Charting a path 
to higher ground is exactly what is needed. I had the honor, as Ernie mentioned in, in the introduction, of being associated with the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament brought together by the governments of Australia and Japan. The Commission's report, which was issued last December, proposes a detailed roadmap to reduce the world's nuclear arsenal to less than 2,000 warheads by 2025. The proposed steps include the entry into force of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the negotiation of a fissile material cutoff treaty, bilateral agreement between the United States and Russia to effect deep reduction in their nuclear holding, de-alerting of nuclear weapons, firm no first use commitment by all nuclear armed states, and many more steps. I do not for one minute underestimate the difficulties involved in implementing such a program. Fortunately, nuclear issues have recently acquired new prominence on leaders' agenda, starting with the United States and Russia's decision to conclude a New START agreement, which will lead to a significant reduction in their nuclear arsenal. It's worth noting that both countries have linked this new agreement to a firm and explicit commitment to pursue complete nuclear disarmament. Indeed, 2010 is shaping up to be a pivotal year for nuclear issues. Later this month, April, President Obama will host a special summit on nuclear issues. In May, signatories of the no Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty will gather in New York for a new review conference. And Prime Minister Harper recently announced that nuclear issue, issues would occupy a prominent place on the agenda of the G8 summit, which will be held next June in Huntsville. It is fitting that the Prime Minister has chosen to give priority to nuclear issues at the G8, which he will chair. Canada, with its special expertise in nuclear technology and its long history of engagement in the construction of effective global governance in this area, is particularly well-placed to play an active role. Our chairmanship of the G8 gives us a unique opportunity to help shape the international response to the nuclear challenges we are facing. To do so, we must first crystallize our own thinking on a host of issues, many of which I mentioned during my presentation. Nuclear governance is not an easy subject, but if we neglect it, I am convinced that we will be living on borrowed time with or without a nuclear renaissance. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'll be happy to, uh, to take questions. Remember, I'm not a nuclear engineer, <laughs> but within these constraints, you're free to ask whatever questions on your mind. There's a microphone in the middle. Uh, yes, uh, Madame Frechette, um, you started, you said that there were, I guess, a study a number of years ago that said there was a potential of doubling the number of nuclear facilities. And then you said it was doubtful and perhaps only a handful. How did you, what analysis, and I realize it's only guesstimates and that no one knows, but what moved you uh, to cut it down to just a handful? Um, let me clarify. First of all, the, the projections to doubling come essentially from um, industry sources, but some international institutions like the International uh, Nuclear Association um, have projected, if not a doubling, a very significant increase. Our study says there will be an increase, but it will not be a doubling. We have not advanced a set number because it's precisely, it's very hard. Uh, we're, but we're saying it's going to be quite a bit more modest that, that has been projected. And when I talk about a handful, I'm talking about the number of new countries that will acquire an inter a nuclear energy program. Uh, right now, there's, what, 30, 35 countries that have a nuclear energy production program. 
uh, some of which are a large number of plants, Russia, China, um, the United States, and France, and a few more. But another 35 or 40 countries have said that they are interested in getting in, in the, the nuclear club, getting starting their own nuclear energy production program. And this is where we say that's not going to be 30 countries. It's going to be a handful. And how we arrived at this is that we looked not only at announced intention, but we broke down all the steps that new countries need to take before they're ready you know, to, <laughs> to get their first watt of electricity out of a new energy program. And this is where when you look, well, you drill down and you look at where they're at on this long road uh, from, from the legislation and the regulatory system in place and so on, uh, you realize that it's very unlikely that between now and 2030, more than a handful of new countries will join the club, especially since, if my memory serves me right, half of the countries that have signify an, an interest do not have sufficient capacity in their electricity grid to absorb the, the, the electricity produced by, by a standard nuclear plants. So um, these countries f face massive, a need for massive investment. And so when you put all these things together, we conclude that, yes, there will be a few new entrants. And I've, I've named the few countries where we think they're well positioned uh, to enter the nuclear club in the next 20 years. Um, it's not going to be 30 or 40. I have a question about nuclear fuel supply. Yeah. So one problem with oil is that it's running out and it's located in countries that have geopolitical problems. Are there any similar sorts of issues around nuclear fuel? Um, for the time being, the, the, the uh, supply of uranium, uh, which is the, the basic source, of fuel that, that needs to be processed uh, seem to be quite abundant um, and quite able to supply the market as it exists not only now but with a significant increase over the, the longer term. Now I'm not talking, I haven't looked into 100 years from now or 80 years from now, but for the next 20, 30, 40 years, there are still many unexploited uh, sources of, uh, of uranium, and the current exploitation suffice to meet the market, uh, the market needs. I, I was interested in your comments about the nu nuclear fuel cycle and the need to develop some equity in, in that uh, do you see that um, the, the production of nuclear fuel, fuel enrichment in particular, and perhaps reprocessing, repro will, will extend beyond the countries that currently have that capacity? Will that be part of what, in other words, will some southern countries have to acquire the cap that capability in order to advance it on an equitable basis? Um, I think for developing countries, the principle of uh, every country being on the same footing is very important. Um, in theory, it's not impossible that the, that the notion that the current producer of, the, the current enrichers of uranium and reprocessors would put their own plant under some form of international supervision would be sufficient to satisfy this uh, requirement that is a fundamental political requirement of equality. My gut feeling is probably like yours, that part of the deal may involve at least locating one plant, one uranium enrichment plant somewhere in the developing world as a further demonstration that the old order uh, is of the past, and uh, there's a new order that is based on equality. Uh, 
um, is uh, is being ushered in. So I think wise uh, uh, wise negotiators and wise uh, diplomats would be well advised to think in those terms if they want this very notion of a uh, of international facilities to replace the current national control. Um, I think they would have to think in terms of strategically located plants and at least one in developing countries. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Prime Minister Harper has announced that he's going to sell the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. What do you think of this proposal? <laughs> um, of course, like uh, any Canadian who's been involved in one way or the other with the history of CANDU, and any Canadian diplomat has been involved in somehow promoting CANDU technology. I certainly was when I was in Argentina. It pains me to think that we would run the risk of, of uh, losing a national capacity doesn't mean that if we sell it, it's going to necessarily leave Canada, that the buyers would, uh, and I assume we can negotiate some conditions. Uh, but I, you know, I, I kind of like the notion that we had a truly national a crown corporation that, uh, that was supported by all Canadians, if you want, to, uh, to develop and nurture this technology. This being said, um, I know full well that you, one has to look at uh, reality in the face. Uh, there hasn't been a sale of can-do in a long time. Uh, I don't know what the, uh, what the requirements in terms of investment uh, in developing, uh, you know, cutting-edge technology, of, of marketing it, of uh, in the face of very, very <laughs> aggressive com competition around the world. I mean, it is quite revealing that the United Arab Emirates decided to turn to a Korean supplier for, for its first uh, power plants. The French Arriva was absolutely certain they were going to get that market because they're, they're, they're big and they, and they offer full service and they have proven technology and what have you. And they didn't. They, they, they all, the, the Koreans um, underbid them quite significantly. So that's just to tell you how how uh, how uh, hot this market is. Um, I think any government has to look at where it will invest public funds, uh, and is this you know where are we in the <laughs> in in the in the downfall of ACL how rusted is are we in terms of of the new technology i'm not well placed to say um, but i have to recognize that in times where you have to make really really tough decisions into where public investment is uh, is best placed then i think it is legitimate to ask the question whether we can hang on to the ACL in its current form, or whether we have to look at other options. As I say, I, I'd, I'd be, I'll be really sad that the ACL disappears if it does, but there may be good reasons for, for history to turn that way, and it, and it may be that our future is not there, that our future rests with some other technology where, like RIM, <laughs> like the Blackberries. Thank you for our response. I guess just a very quick comment. The engineering community is extremely concerned, and they see another Avro arrow coming along. We get, give up the technology where we're world leaders. I think it is a very valid point. But am I say, I'm, no, you have to look at all, the, all the, the priorities and all the imperatives that a government have to, have to face, and where do they put their money? That's. Unfortunately, that's what being in government means. Um, I'm curious about the armament side of the nuclear industry. Um, I don't know if this is too sp specific, but um, depleted uranium projectiles, um, 
As a specific example, uh, radioactivity was actually detected as far away as London in the recent Iraq conflict. I'm just wondering if those kinds of armaments would be covered under the M MPT or if they're exempt. Um, uh, no, I don't think that's, um, that's covered by the MPT itself. No. You would have to have separate conventions because I think they're, they're part of conventional uh, um, uh, that, 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 that's an, they're, they're bullets huh? and, and, and they're tiny parts, particles. So I think you would need uh, some, some other type of arrangements if you wanted to ban that. That's not covered by the APT. Uh, two, uh, two unrelated questions. Uh, the first, you talked about a bank for nuclear fuel. Presumably, if, if the price of nuclear fuel in this bank was at X percent lower than free market prices, presumably that would be the way and a good solution to, uh, uh, to controlling nuclear fuel. Uh, so that's the first question. Why hasn't this idea taken off more? And completely unrelated, uh, why has Canada not pushing more for hydroelectric uh, power? Um, on the first, I think if there were to be a nuclear, the idea of a, of a, of a fuel bank is an attempt to convince countries that say, I need to produce my own fuel because I may be barred from accessing the international market uh, from buying. There's never been a case of a denial of nuclear fuel to a country that has a nuclear, a civilian nuclear program. But it is nevertheless a reason that is being invoked by Iran at the moment. That's, that's the, the rationale given for their enrichment program. So one, among the many ideas that have, been, that have been mentioned to try to counter these arguments that, you know, I need to, develop, to enrich and develop my own fuel production capacity because I may be denied access by, for political reasons, to say, OK, let's find a way to have um, uh, to have a, uh, an international pool. So the, 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 the rationale behind all these proposals is not one of price. It is a political one. What if ever you had a fuel bank, it would have to be priced in a way as to be no more expensive than the, uh, the, the commercial price. It would be kept to the, uh, pegged to the commercial price. But, but the, the reason why it has not happened is that, in fact, countries that at the moment are buying off the market don't need this fuel bank. It's, you know, they're perfectly happy with the fuel services they get from, uh, from the few producers of nuclear fuel. Uh, and the one country that's using the argument that they need to do it domestically because they may be prevented from having fuel if and when they have a nuclear civilian program is not interested for obvious reasons because their, I think, their real reason for embarking on this uranium enrichment program is not because of a, of a, of a civilian program which has not moved very fast. Um, uh, it is because I think they want to master that technology. So this fuel, fuel bank idea may come back at some point as part of a, of a new understanding of how the nuclear environment works. But as a, as a device to answer one of Iran's main objection and main, main reason for going into the uranium, the enrichment business, it, they, haven't, they have not shown any interest. So it remains uh, on, on the table. I think over the long term, you may see a fuel bank established nevertheless. Um, I, have, <laughs> I said at the beginning, I'm not a nuclear expert. I'm definitely not an energy expert. Um, I, I thought we were doing very well with, uh, with hydro. I don't know what is the, what is the uh, 
the unexploited potential uh, in Canada and what, what the, the price, uh, price factor would be. The only thing I would say is that hydro is a, is a clean energy, uh, but it isn't necessarily without its own set of environmental uh, impact and consequences. In the, in the field of energy, the, the, it's, a, it's, always in, it's always a multi, uh, multi-dimensional kind of equation you have to deal with at, in order to decide whether, whether uh, energy is your best option at, uh, at, uh, at any point in time as opposed to, to other options. And what you're, you know, if your concern is, uh, is climate change, then, uh, then hydro will go, go up the list. If you're not concerned about climate change and you don't care about uh, CO2 emissions, then there may be other options that are cl closer to home, uh, that are cheaper. Uh, since you call this a uh, nuclear energy revival, I'm curious um, what caused nuclear energy to follow to favor in the first place? Huh. I think uh, Chernobyl had a, had a lot to do with it. Um, there was a very, very clear cooling <laughs> of, uh, of interest after Chernobyl. Um, concerns in Europe, nuclear programs slowed down in, uh, in Europe. Slowed, well, you, you had also the incident in Three Mile Island, not so long before in the United States. So I think it is largely a concern for, uh, for nuclear safety. Uh, now, this being said, um, no, some countries never went off nuclear. Um, France produces, what, 80% of its university, of its, of its electricity? Uh, from uh, from nuclear sources, and uh, uh, even though they were not that far from the from Chernobyl, uh, the, with uh, with uh, the um, the effect being felt in some parts of northern Europe, uh, they were very close to that, and yet it didn't cool their enthusiasm. I think the uh, the, the Chinese have been slowly building their program, uh, but. Elsewhere, there were decommissioning and, and non-replacement. Some countries decided they would forego nuclear completely. And now, uh, with suddenly the great surge in demand uh, and memories of Chernobyl fading, uh, and on the whole, a very good safety record. Since Chernobyl, um, there have been some technological improvements. The, the, the model that, uh, that was used in Chernobyl as, you know, is no longer in use. There is general agreement that the new plants are, are safer. Uh, and I described in, in my presentation all the measures that were taken internationally. So that has, again, raised the, the confidence level. And while I think in many countries, Nuclear is not necessarily the first choice or the preferred choice. Uh, I think many countries face, uh, face um, a pattern of uh, energy demand that is such that it forces everybody to look at the full range of options. You know, you look at China. China is doing everything. It's doing it's it's doing nuclear, but it's also doing uh, uh, hydro, and it's doing coal, and it's doing gas, and it's it's using every conceivable source because the demand is going up. So, and that's a fairly recent phenomenon. It's not something you would have seen 20 years ago. Uh, this was kind of in uh, building on a, an earlier question. I was just wondering as far as weapons pr proliferation, um, traditionally the, the larger stockpiles in the great powers, if you will, have been a source of security for them. And while that might be changed in an international context nowadays, um, in order for a uh, new NPT, in a way, to kind of me be meaningful, it would involve more equality across uh, who can have nuclear weapons, who can't. Um, what kind of incentive is there, is there, or what kind of willingness is there on behalf of the great powers? I know you mentioned Kissinger earlier. Um, are they willing to kind of proceed down this route that would essentially take away one of their uh, primary political and military 
po strategic points? Well, um, if you go by what President Obama has said uh, publicly on more than one occasion, uh, he is embracing the notion of full and total elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, and this had been echoed in, in Moscow. Now, it's very significant because these two countries hold 80% of the nuclear warheads. So it's clear that if you're going to have a movement towards the full elimination, it has to start with these two countries. Once these two countries have taken very significant step, and take, they have taken the first one, uh, at some point, they will be, and the, the rest of us who don't have the bomb will be in a better position to start pressuring the others to, uh, to get engaged. And there you find that there are so many strategic linkages. I mean, the next shoe to fall will have to be China. And if China can be persuaded to, um, uh, to stop adding, <laughs> uh, the first thing that we should try to do is persuade China to, n to not add to, this, to, to it, its arsenal and to be much more transparent about what they actually have. Uh, and as Russia and China and, uh, and the United States reduce their arsenal, then I think the next one sh really should be China taking the next step. And if China moves, I think India can move as well. And if India moves, Pakistan can move. But it cannot be the, in, the <laughs> in, the, in the reverse order. I don't mention the UK and France because, frankly, I think they are quite marginal at the moment. The UK has very little left. Um, and uh, France is more concerned. So France is philosophically still quite attached to its nuclear weapon status. Uh, but, you know, if the bigger players move, at some point it becomes inevitable, they have to move too. And if, and if these countries uh, move, then it puts enormous pressure on the would-be nuclear weapons country uh, to, um, to carry on nevertheless. You know, if, 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 if the tide is going this way, it becomes a lot harder for the Irans of this world to go the other way because one of the, one of the benefits of, this, of these first steps and the building up of a momentum is that it allows for, I think, potentially a much stronger political coalition uh, to put pressure on would-be new, new nuclear states. At the moment, what I find really worrisome is that while I can't think of one country that really hopes that Iran will get its nuclear weapon, uh, there are very few countries that actually are getting engaged politically. Uh, Partly because there is this unequal treaty. There are the five big five that, was, that promised 40 years ago to move towards its armament and haven't done it. So a lot of countries sit on their hands. And if you look at who's doing the negotiation uh, with Iran, it's, uh, it's, it's the P5 plus, plus Germany and other countries whose voice could matter if they really if they really sided clearly against uh, some adventures in Iran, like Brazil, for instance, and some of the bigger African countries. But they're sitting on the sideline because the overall regime is imbalanced and it's politically unappealing to them. So I think as, as a momentum towards disarmament develops, uh, it becomes a, a tool in itself to handle, to contain, uh, the, uh, the, the proliferation. Now, the really big question, uh, which I didn't address in my presentation, is, is uh, you, can see, you can see a gradual reduction. And this Japanese-Australian commission stop before getting to zero. Their, their game plan, their, their, their blueprint stops at 2,000 warhead all-inclusive. But the real question is, how do you move from there to zero? 
And I think the first thing you have to, mem to remember is if you manage to get to this very low number 20 years from now, it will be because there will have been many, many steps taken, but not in the, the, uh, the test ban treaty, uh, the, the, the de-alerting, and you will have found ways to raise confidence so that the climate, the environment, will be very different 20 years from now if we don't stop down the road. And <clears throat> then it is today, and it will make it possible to start thinking for real about getting from a low number where everybody <laughs> can keep a few <laughs> as an insurance policy to a, to a real zero. And one of the key instruments that will have to be invented is the verification, because no country that actually currently has a, uh, a weapon will give it up unless it's absolutely certain then its partners in crime also do. And this is where verification mechanisms have to be developed. There's very interesting work being done at the moment. Uh, there's an interesting project between the UK and Norway. They're trying to develop a workable verification regime, one that will be robust enough that countries can feel confident that there are eyes and ears and technological means and whatever to give everybody assurance that if they all take the last step together, then it will be verifiable. Sorry for the long answer, but <laughs> your question just uh, <laughs> gave me a chance to round it up. So, oh, last question. I'm sorry, everything you talk about verification, I brought to the thought of, I don't think Israel will ever give up nuclear because of its geographic location, because of its threat. You may, you know, talk other countries into it, larger players, but at that point, I don't think they will ever get to zero. What do you have to say about that? Um, today, Israel would not give up its, its weapons, no more than, uh, than, than India will give up its weapons or Pakistan will give up its weapon. You have to create different political conditions uh, but if there is a peace process in the Middle East, and there is peace, and nobody else has, has, uh, has nuclear weapons, uh, then it becomes an option for Israel uh, that becomes a possibility. Uh, today, no, it isn't a possibility, but peace in the Middle East is not impossible. Um, Putting an end to the Iranian ambitions is not impossible. The goal of total disarmament is not impossible. You know, there are categories of weapons that exist that would serve Israel's security need just as well, but that are not, is not being used by Israel or by any country in the world. They have been banned and declared unacceptable under any condition by anybody. Biological weapons, and chemical weapons. Uh, and the international community has agreed that these weapons, even though they're easy to make, anybody can make chemical weapons. It's not a big deal. Uh, and it certainly would protect whoever had it in a little pot <laughs> on the desk of the prime minister, and yet nobody. Everybody's agreed that this is beyond the pale. Nobody will do this. Uh, so it isn't inconceivable that we could get to the same point with nuclear weapons. Granted, many, many steps will have to be taken. You know, Israel will have to be reassured that it can, that its safe security has been assured by a peace agreement, by reinforced alliances and, 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 and treaties of cooperation. It did so with Egypt. It's not inconceivable that it could do so with, with other partners in the region. So in today's condition, no, but one, I, would, I don't accept that never can they or will they. And I'm not sure that the Israeli themselves would say that. Right. And I agree with you. There's too many ifs. And, and between now and the future, which you would want to get to zero, there are so many, many ifs that get to get to. But it's life. Huh? There's always many ifs, but you have to know where you want to get. Uh -huh. if, you, if you don't try to get to, to, to zero, you'll never get there. Mm -hmm. So one day at a time. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Frechette, for um, a, a, a terrific uh, talk. Very uh, complex set of issues on of governance related to the, the nuclear energy, uh, which, you've, which you really helped to clarify and systematize and organize for us and help us under, understand it. We uh, really appreciated the way in which you were able to rain, go through the full range of issues right from nuclear energy through, through to nuclear disarmament and under, help us understand the way in which these issues are uh, intimately uh, linked. I think it's a tribute to you and to um, CG that you decided some years back to embark upon this uh, uh, study which is coming to fruition at a, at a very key moment, as you, as, as you pointed out. The nuclear issue is, is, um, uh, has, is, is a major issue uh, before us. A great deal of the public um, exploration of this issue relates to uh, st uh, START, the Strategic Arms Reduction uh, uh, Treaty and, and nuclear disarmament, but you've shown that a, that a very critical element of this uh, objective uh, begins with the, uh, the nuclear technology related to uh, energy and I think we're very fortunate that uh, in this discussion we've got this background. And, and in saying that, I, I should remind you, or, or, or um, Colleen has, has said that there are copies of the report at, uh, at one of the back uh, tables there, so please uh, feel free to help yourself uh, to it. And, uh, but before uh, doing that, well, I hope you will uh, uh, join me once again in, in uh, thanking our guest for her presentation. Thank you very much. Supported nuclear energy revival to the year 2030. Not to make a judgment on the merits of nuclear energy, but rather to predict its future. Second purpose of the project was to consider the implications for global governance in the areas of nuclear safety, security, and non-proliferation. And third, to make recommendations to policymakers in Canada and abroad on ways to strengthen global governance in these areas. Before I want to uh, I go any further, I want to um, uh, inform you that the findings of the, the study are all available on uh, CG's website. It consists of, of three parts. There's a very long detailed report, about 300 pages, plus a about 30, 40 page summary, which frankly for everybody but the really keen people would give you plenty of information. And then there is an action plan where we try to extract key conclusions and recommendations for the benefit of our policymakers. And this document in particular has been circulated widely to decision makers in, 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 in Ottawa and in Ontario and uh, in many other uh, centers of, uh, of policy making in Canada and abroad. So let me start with the so-called nuclear renaissance. Why is there a renewed interest in nuclear power? Well, for some countries, concerns over climate change figure prominently. Nuclear is seen as offering a cleaner alternative to coal or oil, at least as a transitory solution until renewable sources like solar and wind can produce energy in sufficient quantities to satisfy large-scale demand. But for most countries, we found, for most countries contemplating new investment in nuclear energy, it is energy security. And genuinely an honor to introduce our uh, speaker, Madame Louise Frechette, this, uh, this evening. Um, I guess we're really welcoming, welcoming her home. Uh, for you all know her as uh, a distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Part of her role at CG has been to chair the project on nuclear energy and the challenges it presents to global governance. And of course, she's going to be speaking on that uh, very topic this, uh, this evening. 
but we also know her as a, one of Canada's preeminent public servants with an extraordinary career and record of service both nationally and internationally. There isn't uh, time to recount that entire career and all, all of those achievements this evening, but I did want to take a few minutes to, uh, to remind you of why the word extraordinary is the right one to use when, we, when we're talking about Louise Frechette. Her work in uh, the public service of Canada led her to its highest ranks. As a diplomat, her work included stints as ambassador to Argentina and Uruguay, and uh, later she served as Canada's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. As a member of the public service in, uh, in Ottawa, she also served as Associate Deputy Minister of Finance and as, as Deputy Minister of National Defense. Having served as the United Nations, as the United Na having, having served at the United Nations um, as Canada's ambassador, she returned there for an eight-year um, uh, stretch from 1998 to 2006 to serve as Deputy Secretary General of the, of the UN. She was the first incumbent in that uh, post, and in it she worked closely with and assisted Secretary General Kofi Annan in the full range of his uh, uh, responsibilities. Her public service has extended to work on a wide range of organizational boards, including service as the chair of the, of the board of directors of the Pearson Peacekeeping Center. There are many others as well, and you'll be interested to note her uh, membership and uh, work on the board of the gov uh, board of governors of the University of uh, Waterloo. Madame Pr uh, Frechette pursued formal education in Montreal and Belgium, and she is, as you might expect, also the recipient of many awards and honors. That includes honorary degrees from a large number of uh, Canadian universities, including again the University of Waterloo, the Royal Military College and also from beyond Canada, including uh, from Kyung Hee University in Seoul, Korea, and the University of Turin in, in uh, Italy. She received the Distinguished Canadian Leadership Award of the University of Ottawa in 2005. Among other honors, Madame Frechette is an officer of the Order of Canada. I wanted to, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, one, other, one other area of her work, and that is that she has also had very extensive engagement with the nuclear issues that she's going to address uh, tonight. She was invited by the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency to be a member of the Commission of Eminent Persons, which issued a report in 2008 on the challenges of nuclear energy and the future of the IAEA. She also served on the advisory committee to the International Commission on uh, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament established by the governments of Australia and uh, Japan, uh, established in, in 2008, and uh, its terrific report called The Eliminating Nuclear Threats was released in late 2009. It's uh, a great pleasure to have the uh, opportunity to hear you this evening, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, will you uh, join me in welcoming uh, Louise Frechet. I have not had much to do with arms control and disarmaments in the course of my diplomatic career. I always considered this area uh, as one requiring infinite patience. And I saw my colleagues who worked in this area as kind of the monks of the diplomatic profession, people whose reward would come not in this world, but perhaps in the next. So you might ask how come I got involved in this nuclear issue. Well, the idea goes back to the end of 2005, as I was starting to think of my life after the United Nations. CG at that point invited me to join the organization and suggested I might want to do research on UN reform. I paused and said, no way. I really needed a change. I wanted to really get away from a subject that had occupied me morning, noon, and night for eight years, and I wanted to do something different. 
and I suggested to CG a project on nuclear issues instead. Why? Because I had been alarmed by the deepening divisions within the international community on nuclear issues, which had been revealed at the September 2005 UN summit. The fact that the summit communique did not contain a single line on nuclear proliferation and disarmament signaled serious problems in the global nuclear governance system. At the same time, talks of a nuclear revival <coughs> were starting to be heard with increasing frequency. This would mean more nuclear power plants, more nuclear material, more technicians and scientists with the detailed knowledge of nuclear technology. Thus was born the Nuclear Energy Futures Project, which concluded its work a few weeks ago. The purpose was threefold. First, to investigate the likely size, shape, and nature of the proposal. Good evening, everybody. And first of all, let me thank you for joining me tonight on this Easter Monday. I was a little worried when it was suggested as I speak tonight that nobody would show up. So I'm very, <laughs> I'm very touched that uh, so many of you have. Whoops. Is this yours, Ernie? <laughs> there. Uh, so I'm really happy that so many of you have uh, made your way to CG to, uh, to listen to this presentation. I want to thank Ernie Regeer for his very, very generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, he's uh, far too generous in his uh, comments, but they're much appreciated. As he said, it's my, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm on my home turf when I address a CG uh, audience. Uh, and I must say that over the last nearly four years now, I've come to appreciate uh, not only CG as a, as a vibrant institution and the University of Waterloo because I am a member of, uh, of their board, but also this community, which is, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm right, considered one of the smartest communities on earth, and, uh, and now I know why. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be associated with CG, and I consider myself part of this community, at least part-time, even if I don't live here on a full-time basis. I should add that um, Ernie asked me whether my CV was up to date, and I said yes, but in fact it wasn't, because um, I don't think it, uh, it mentions that I received quite recently a honorary degree from uh, Wilfrid Laurier as well. So I'm, I'm doubly associated with, uh, with universities in Waterloo. Now, as the title of my presentation indicates, I'm here to talk about global nuclear governance and in particular to share with you the conclusions of the project which I had the honor to chair at CG for over the last three years. Now let me state at the outset that I'm not an expert on nuclear matters and I